We are storytellers. That has always been our mission here at Emma. We ask ourselves, what are the environmental stories that need to be told? In 2014, we shot the PSA, What the Frack? And we were the first environmental organization to take a proactive stand on drilling and fracking. In 2015, we went to Nebraska to shoot That's KXL, a PSA that featured Willie Nelson and Neil Young performing, and a range of voices supporting the movement to stop the Keystone Pipeline. In 2016, Emma supported the grassroots movement opposing construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Our CEO, Debbie Levin, along with board members Francis Fisher, Ray Halberter, Daryl Hanna, Nikki Reed, Ian Summerhalder, John Quigley, and Shailene Woodley joined the protest at Standing Rock Indian Reservation in North Dakota. And the fight goes on. The proposed route for Line 3 crosses 227 lakes and rivers, including the Mississippi and rivers that feed directly into Lake Superior, not to mention a sovereign nation with treaty rights to the sacred streams and wetlands where they hunt, fish, and harvest wild rice. Line 3 would put all these waterways at risk of a spill from the 760,000 barrels of tar sands oil that would flow through Line 3 every day. To help us understand what's at stake, please welcome Emma Board Chair, representative of the Oneida Indian Nation, and Chief Executive Officer of its Enterprises, Ray Halbreder, and David Archambault, former Tribal Chairman at Standing Rock. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Uh, Ray, the Native American communities have been struggling to keep oil drilling off their lands for decades, for more than decades. The United Nation was very active in the fight against the Dakota Pipeline, even funding legal action on behalf of the journalists who were covering the protests who were injured. Can you talk about the significance of this fight to the Oneidas, to Indian country, and to the environmental community at large? Well, the, um, the involvement for the nation was uh, based on our, our, care, our concern for, the, for not only the standing, standing Rock community, Native people community, but for uh, our planet, for Earth, for our country, for environmental issues. And, you know, when our, our people, uh, when we gather, whenever we do our ceremonies, we always have uh, an a Thanksgiving address, it's called. It's it's a ceremony of beginning. And it always begins with uh, r reminding ourselves um, that we are all part of creation, that we are not superior to other parts of creation, that we are all part of it, that we are equal to it, and that we need to care for that. We need to remind ourselves of that. So every time our ceremonies begin, we remind ourselves the significance of our and, and our rightful place on this earth, uh, we're only part of creation, and 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 there's a responsibility we have uh, to care for and look out for other parts of creation that may be in jeopardy, um, because what we have today is really uh, is really belongs to our children, our the future generations. We're only caretakers for them, so we need to take care of it and remind ourselves. And sometimes. Um, you know, things happen that, uh, that jeopardize our earth, that jeopardize our mother, that jeopardize our communities. So we heard about what was happening at Standing Rock, and uh, it was a great concern to us, and so we helped support to the extent we could. And uh, I'm so pleased that uh, David, uh, Dave Archambault, the, the former chairman of Standing Rock, during that time period is here, and can certainly speak to that, but uh, but from that belief about who we are and our rightful place in the world, and sometimes those discussions, sometimes when we think about what we have to do, it, there's got to be a certain uh, understanding of what we're trying to do, and it's always good to remind ourselves what our proper place is in in the planet. This is how we view it, 
and we're reminded that from our from our from our culture it comes from our cultural teachings and so we knew that there was a real issue uh, the black snake uh, was jeopardizing putting in jeopardy a uh, jeopardy a uh, historic community a sovereign land base and a people uh, indigenous people community in in this planet and that was something we needed to stand up and, and speak against and, and to talk about. And I don't, it was one of those events that really brought not just a national awareness, but an international awareness to this issue. And sometimes we have to do things like this just so people still remember there are native people that still live here, that still inhabit this country. So uh, we were, of course, we weren't, successful in stopping the pipeline, but we were very successful in creating an awareness. And I really credit um, Chairman Dave and his people, the supporters and the people who participated in achieving a level of awareness that, uh, that we don't always have about these issues. And you, and before we go to David, um, last night we were talking about this and you were mentioning that Oftentimes people don't realize the depth of commitment that the native people have for the land and, and that it's something that I think uh, our government has underestimated their willingness to like stand and be counted and not back down. And that was so visible at Standing Rock. I think it really took the world by surprise. And Dave, maybe you'd like to talk about how things are going and how what that experience was. No, it was, um, you know, I, I always think about, um, I get a chance to reflect now that I'm not in the middle of it. And what I, what I realized is that it happened the way it had to happen. Uh, there was no controlling uh, uh, what was going to happen. We, we kind of uh, knew what the country was trying to do. Uh, it wasn't the first time that the country has done Indian country wrong. Uh, we knew we were up against um, a court system, a federal court system, federal laws that uh, is stacked against us. The, we knew that uh, the industry was, was supported by um, our supporting the elected officials like uh, congressmen, senators. And so uh, we, we were up against a state that was pro-oil um, and we knew that we weren't being heard, but we also understood that we had to, we had to say something. We had to say, do, do something. And it was something that was driven by our youth. Our, our youth were the ones who were saying that we, we don't want this pipeline because it's going to threaten the future of not us, but our children or our grandchildren. And when our youth speak, and we always encourage our youth to speak, when they do speak, then we have to listen. So... We stood up and we, we took a stance, um, even though we knew the chances of us not being able to stop the pipeline was, was high. So uh, not knowing what was going to be the outcome, um, a lot of times people think of it as a, a failure because we didn't stop the pipeline. But I always look at it as a success because, like Ray was saying, we... We were um, just a tribe, and we had tribal support. The Oneidas came to Standing Rock. The Navajos came to Standing Rock. Uh, 360 different tribes came to Standing Rock and stood in solidarity. It never happened before, and it, ha it was organic. It had a life of its own. Um, it was a movement that inspired people, brought the Indian uh, population uh, back to life. That, that saying to this government, saying to this country that you can no longer suppress us. You have to start listening to us. And that was the win to me. To me was seeing the uprising of, of tribal nations throughout the world, not just in the United States. We had tribal nations from other countries come and, and coming up and standing beside us and saying, listen, uh, the power in that. And, and uh, also remembering that our way of life is something that we've been sharing for centuries. Uh, uh, the way, uh, you know, I, I was listening to the, some of the, the presentations prior, and I, I hear the technology and the science behind everything. 
but when I when I think of the laws, I think of a universal law that everything is like Ray was saying, everything is connected, everything is related, and and in our in our uh, belief, every one of us, everything that has a a nagi or a soul is related. So like if if I looked out in a field and I saw movement, I would say. There's a nagi there. Whether it's a blade of grass swinging in the wind or an animal or a bird, they have nagis. And if they have nagis, our spirits, our souls, then we're related, we're connected, and we have to speak for them. The ones that crawl, the ones that fly, the ones that slither there, the ones that swim, we have to be a voice for them because what's happening is uh, it's threatening the entire environment that they live in, that we live in, so that we can live together with them. And so... Uh, it's 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 a law that supersedes federal law, supersedes uh, Newton's law of movement. So, and those laws are important for this society today. But then, if you look, how can they apply to the spirituality of our nation, of our people, our spirituality laws, or how can they apply to how does Newton's law of physics apply to space? It doesn't. So there's always something more out there. And indigenous people had a good understanding of that, uh, and they still have that understanding. But uh, it's crazy because now you hear scientists today saying, at a molecular level, molecular level, we are all the same. And then you say, wait, stop. You guys are not listening to us. And so this uprising again is giving us an oppor- opportunity to hear uh, what our concerns are and how we can address them, whether it's in the political environment or a, a economic environment. Um, how can we make the change that's necessary so that we don't destroy everything for the, the kids who are not even born yet? Yeah. And I, th- I think so, so many young people that you're... you're your model resonates so much with them, and understandably, they are so upset with so many of us who are older and have screwed this up so badly. We all have much to learn from you guys. Um, on the the subject of tribal sovereignty, um, I would love you you both to just help explain a little more what that is and the connection between what has been happening in Nebraska and Dakota and, uh, and now in Minnesota with Line 3, and how that can all be directly, you can follow the dots and see how it's corporations that are often supported by the federal government that have, that have sort of propagated these abuses and these abuses of, of your, your sovereignty. Can you address that? Well, when the... Um the colonists it began to colonize this country. Um, they encountered, of course, Indian nations. And we think of ourselves as nations in the fully international sense, uh, with the rights to determine our own future, our own government, and decisions for ourselves. Um, there are three sovereign, if you, under the law, there are sort of three sovereign groups that occupy this country. There's the federal government, there's states, and there's tribal nations. Tribal nations, however, um, from the beginning, uh, began to lose much of their land and much of their power. So economy, money is power. And so as time went on, for example, with the United Nation, we were closer to the development of the colony uh, of the settlers. So we encountered them for many years. And we made treaties, and treaties are not made with your own citizens. Treaties are made with sovereign nations, so we have treaties. We have a treaty that to this day we still receive treaty cloth from from 1794. It was the treaty with the Six Nations. Um, Part of that, interestingly, um, part of that treaty guarantees us about 300,000 acres of land in central New York. But the Supreme Court recently ruled that while we give you the treaty cloth and the treaty's still valid, you're not entitled to the land because it's just too late. It's to, you know, I, it, it's, it goes back to you know, great nations like great men should keep their word. Um, we haven't forgotten, our people haven't forgotten, 
but the sovereignty of Indian nations is still recognized to a certain extent. Tribal gaming in this country exists because they recognize that sovereign right of tribes to conduct the opportunity of gaming um, without state or federal prohibition. So, but we are at the whim of the federal government. Now the state's government, we often that conflict with, but with federal government, um, that is considered uh, supreme law. Um, interestingly, treaties are under the Constitution considered to be the supreme law of the land as well. But if it sounds complicated, it's because it, because it is. And there are so many different ways that the laws and the courts take. You know, they they try to make they try to get out of the plain language of treaties with all of this intellectual discussion, and it's very plain. And we have a treaty, we get treaty cloth. My grandmother said, no matter how small, um, I know we don't have a lot of time, it just it takes a while to explain this, but the treaty cloth, there was an amount of money. Now just think, since 1794, someone in the federal government every year goes, makes out a requ requ uh, requisition and gets a certain amount of treaty cloth. The amount of money remained the same, but due to inflation, the amount that you can buy gets very small. So this, you know, today we get a, a piece of cloth about, about this long and about that wide. And my grandmother said, no matter if it gets to the size of a postage stamp, go get the treaty cloth. Obviously, because it means the other parts of the treaty are, are valid as well. So that, that's an example. So Indian nations have lands that have been reserved to them. That's why they're called reservations. In language, they say the lands are reserved, so they're called reservations. And they do exercise a certain amount of sovereignty, but they very often are at a very strong disadvantage because they don't have the economic power that their lands were taken, our lands were taken, so the economy that is driven from those lands and timber and resources and mineral belongs to someone else. The Black Hills, and Dave can tell you all about the Black Hills uh, were guaranteed to the treaty and, uh, to, to the to the Sioux and the Treaty of Fort Laramie, but was immediately broken when they discovered gold in Black Hills, and because and the Black Hills were sacred to the Sioux people, and that is why one of the reasons they proposed to build Mount Rushmore, because those were right in the Black Hills, and because they were sacred, they wanted to destroy that connection of that sacred fear, that sacred belief between the Sioux people and those hills. So now you've got these big heads, uh, you know. It, up there on the mountain, you know, forever. But there's also another one, uh, Crazy Horses being um, carved as well nearby that's actually larger than the Mount Rushmore. Um, well, anyway, there's, uh, it takes a while to explain, but that gives you a sense of it. Dave, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just, stuff? like, real quick. We, oh, when, when we were addressing the Kota Access Pipeline with the company and with the government, both, the United States Corps of Engineers or U.S. Army Civil Works. My question to them is why, why do you have to do this? Why do you have to put, what, what is the, why is it a requirement that you put this pipeline 500 feet from our nation underneath a, a water source that we depend on uh, for our life? And uh, the response is, well, this has to happen because, and it's from both the corporation um, energy transfer partners and uh, the government both at different times said the same thing. So I know they were communicating together. It's, it's for energy independence, for economic development, and national security. This pipeline has to go in for those three reasons for this great nation. And I'm sitting there and I say, and I have to say, pump on the brakes. So one second, just think about what you said. And I could go back in history and I can tell you. When our nation, when, when indigenous peoples in the United States have paid for energy independence, economic development, and national security. And just with my tribe, I can tell you, uh, for national security, you took the Black Hills. The Black Hills is our origin story, our creation story. Uh, the Black Hills is, is considered the heart of the world to us. And you took it from us uh, for gold. Gold is used to back the U.S. dollar. You're taking it for national security. 
for for energy independence, you built the largest dam system in the world. This dam, this damn dam, flooded all of our lands. Every every piece of our land, uh, every land that was flooded was with tribal nations, and it was strategically placed like that so that the remaining land that we had was inundated with floodwaters so that we can create hydroelectricity, so this nation can be in energy independent. And for economic development, you took land from us. In North Dakota, South Dakota, agriculture was the leading uh, economic driver for those states. And uh, f- the, the most pristine farmland within tribal nations was taken, unceded land taken from tribal nations in 1910 with the uh, our 19, uh, 1889 Dawes Act, the 1910 uh, Burke and Curtis Acts, you know, all of these acts by the Congress, and we weren't even considered citizens. Acts of Congress were, were doing these things for economic development, energy, trans, uh, energy uh, independence, and national security. And now you're coming to me today saying that these are the reasons for this pipeline. Why can't you do it someplace else? Why do you have to continue to make us pay the cost for this great nation? And I used to get tired of people saying, why are you guys complaining all the time? Why don't you just be quiet and sit back? And that was 100 years ago that uh, our people took your land. But it, it, it's, the takings continue today and tell you how everybody has to stop and wake up and think about what's really happening to this world and where the answers can come from. Indigenous communities around the world in, in, in South America have answers but we continue to destroy the lungs of this world. So there's just different things. That no, it's like the great unraveling, and we have much to learn from you. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for, uh, for filling this in. On us. Appreciate it. I would now like to bring on two Emma board members that have been fighting these fights for, uh, both on the ground and in the media. Francis Fisher and John Quigley. We are also fortunate to have Alex Seintz, a mixed race woman originally from the Cheyenne, Ute, Arapaho, and Sioux territories, and who now resides in Tongva, Chumash, and the Tataviam territories, Los Angeles. Want to come out, people? <laughs> Oh, she is also the executive director and founder of the LA chapter of International Indigenous Youth Council. Hi, Francis. Uh, and uh, before we continue, Alexis uh, is going to start us off with a land acknowledgement. So if you would all just please join us and stand. Hello, my name is Alexis Sines, and I'm a mixed race indigenous woman of indigenous and European descent. I've been reconnecting back to my roots and I have been adopted by the Diné and Lakota nations, and my family comes from New Mexico as well as Mexico. And I have received permission today from our Tongva relatives, the Calderon family, to do a land acknowledgement, and I will do a short prayer after. We acknowledge that we are currently on unceded lands of the Gabarlino Tongva and the Gabarlino Quiche people. We honor the ancestors of the village of Yangna, now called Los Angeles, and we honor their living descendants, the people of Tongvangar. Tonkashila Wopila, thank you so much for bringing us all here today. Just want to pray for the ancestors uh, that are here walking these lands still. Also want to pray for our future generations. May they know love and resilience and strength. I also want to pray for our sacred plants and medicines, pray for the four directions, Unchimaka, Mother Earth, the fire, uh, the water, and also want to pray for our communities, everyone out on the front lines, and pray for everyone that is here today. May you open our hearts and our minds and to receive these messages that are coming through on all of these panels. Thank you so much. Aho, mataku yoi oyasen. All my relations. Thank you. 
Uh, at some point, I think we are going to also uh, welcome, and we are deeply grateful, to have activist, economist, author, and director of Honor the Earth, Winona LaDuke, who will be joining us on Skype. Uh, let's start out, though, with John, who is going to fill us in on what's happening now in Nebraska. Um, thanks, Wendy. Uh, I think it's important, when you look at these three issues, there is one central thread, one central storyline, which is water and oil. And in each case, oil and its dirtiest version, tar sands, is threatening major sources of water that are critical for life. I'm going to talk about the Keystone fight, which is one of the great victories of the last 10, 15 years. I traveled to Nebraska almost 10 years ago. I had an environmentalist friend call me and say, what are you doing working on Keystone? You know that's a done deal, don't you? And I said, it's not a done deal because it hasn't been built yet. And he said, but we all know that Obama's going to let it go through. And I said, well, we're taking a stand because it's the right thing to do. And right now, every mile of pipeline built is a mile in the wrong direction. So we have this whole effort, and it's not pleasant, it's messy, it's ugly. The stuff the police are doing in all these fights is nasty. But it has to be done because we are stopping the onslaught of moving in the wrong direction. But I think you'll hear a lot about uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, Pipeline, Standing Rock, and Line 3. But we do have a hopeful victory here with Keystone. And I just want to re, uh, remind us all how that came about. So what you had in, in, in this fight is an unprecedented alliance across the board. You had conservative ranchers and farmers who joined with tribal nations on the ground. Ground Zero ended up being in Nebraska, where the Agalala Aquifer was threatened, 30% of our agricultural water, for a pipeline that was just going to enrich a few people, provide temporary jobs, and then it was all going to go down to New Orleans and be sold to the highest bidder. So basically, we were threatening the very life force at the, at the heart of our country, for a few people enriching themselves. And this unprecedented alliance, including youth who got arrested every day in front of the White House, it, was, it went on for years. And then ultimately we won the victory. And we were involved with uh, a giant crop art and a concert with Willie Nelson and Neil Young that was one of the final blows during the Obama administration on the farm of... Uh, Art Tanderup and his wife, Helen. And they, I mean, it was an amazing uh, combination of creative actions that took place. They even reached out to the Ponca Indians and they planted sacred Ponca corn exactly in the pathway of the route that was going to go through their farm because it is given uh, additional federal protections. The fact that sacred ponca corn was growing on that farm was an impediment to the route. So this cowboy and Indian alliance that, that grew up together, I think, is a beautiful model for the new spectrum of politics, which isn't about left and right, progressive and conservative. It's about water and oil. It's about life and greed. And I have a, a letter from Art I call him America's favorite farmer. If you met him, he would be your best friend immediately. Thank you, Francis. And this is a message to President Biden because he is a central player in this mix. Obviously, when we won under Obama, as soon as Trump got in, and we also saw this with Standing Rock, it went the other way. But what they did, and it's, this is really crucial, they were relentless. Even when the victory was won, they stayed in the courts, they stayed on the ground, every local meeting with the ranchers, the farmers, they kept fighting it, knowing that if a new president got in, it could go the other way. So that's, this is our work 
for the rest of our lives as we ramp down this industrial push. So this is the message from Art. President Biden, the farmers, ranchers, tribal nations, environmental groups, and many alliances owe you the deepest appreciation for giving the final blow to the Keystone XL pipeline. Even after your cancellation, TransCanada continued eminent domain on 60 some strong landowners. Our attorneys did a great work and persuaded them to stop the eminent domain taking and give the land back. The reason they were doing that is they wanted to get the eminent domain so they could sell the route to another company who could then go back and try to make the pipeline work. So that's where that, that just relentlessness is crucial. And this is back to Art's letter. Elections matter. Elections have power. We thank you, President Biden. We applaud your work to make the world a more livable place for our great grandchildren. But if you want to stop this climate catastrophe and to truly build back better, you must cancel the Dakota Access Pipeline and Line 3. You have the power to make it happen. That's from Art Tanderin. Thank you, John. Thank you. Francis, you were on the ground at Standing Rock, and there is so much to talk about in terms of that trip. You joined other board members. Debbie was with you, and uh, it was quite an extraordinary event. And those of us who watched from afar uh, were really impacted by it. I would like you to explain what you think that standing in solidarity, how crucial it was for people to come together as all of you did and how much that really changed the hearts and minds of not only people here, but around the world. Ah, well, I went because I heard about it and I went without knowing who was there. Because I think Debbie joined me afterwards. There, where are you? There you are. What? Oh, yeah, that was the prayer. Oh, my God, I never saw that. I lost that hat at Standing Rock. And can I just say, share for a moment about the magic? I have been looking for that hat ever since, not literally, but like who made it? Where did I get it? You know, I was like looking in boutiques and things like that. I just came back from Nova Scotia, and the woman who was my dresser said, Francis, we worked together 10 years ago. Remember those hats I gave you? And I looked, I went, you made the hat? I couldn't remember. Anyway, I got my hat back. She made me a new one. I'm sorry I just went off on a tangent, but I want that picture, please. We'll make sure <laughs> so I went it. to Standing Rock, uh, not knowing a soul, and arrived there and was immediately taken in uh, by these amazing people. And I learned the hug. I've talked about this before. But there's nothing like the hugs of the indigenous people because it's not like a Hollywood hug where it's like, hi, how are you? It's they really embrace you. You have the, ch the, the exchange of energy that happens. And I was transformed. Um, and then, yes, uh, Debbie came and, and uh, Shailene was there and, you know, Daryl and you know, so many people. Um, I think we were all called, weren't we? We were called alone. It wasn't like, hey, let's all go. It's like everybody individually felt we, we've just got to be there. Uh, what was your question? I, I think I was asking about, um, about what was so extraordinary about that was the solidarity of the people there and that it lifted up. It's another example of who are the messengers and how do you get what's happening here out into the world and into people's eyeballs and hearts and minds Into and, their and that was an amazing well, th th it was amazing because there were there were a lot of of, of uh you know um journalists and and independent people who were getting the message out and uh you know when we were at camp we couldn't use our cell phones because remember you 
and and what what am I trying to say? Uh, there was there was a place called uh, Telegraph Hill where you could you could get a Wi-Fi signal, and that's where everybody would go to you know send in their stories. But while you were at camp, you just had to use your intuition to find people because there was no texting and going, where are you now? And it's like, oh, I'm, you know, five, five teepees down to the left past the horse stalls and, you know, go past the trailer and I'll be over there in about an hour. It's like, that's how it was. It was so extraordinary. And I think that um, as we all communicated with our own uh, circles, the the message got out finally, and I think you know Shailene getting arrested was was a horrible thing that happened to her. But it that was the first time that it hit the national press. I think, yeah. right? Don't don't yeah. you agree? Yeah. And um, then you know more and more people came, and uh, you did your amazing medicine wheel, human medicine wheel, aerial uh, uh, shot of people. Uh, that that went all over, right? Um, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. good. No, that's good. And we are um, actually now going to have a chance, and I'm going to t- get you off the hook, uh, to talk to Nicole Donahue, who is in Standing Rock, and will give us a short update. Nicole, can you tell us what's what's taking place there now? Hi, hi, uh, Nicole Donahue. Uh, I'm Papa Lakota from Standing Rock. Um, quick introduction. So, uh, a little bit of background since what uh, since 2016 of what's been happening here in 2019. Energy Transfer Partners uh, requested that the North Dakota Public Service Commission increase their shipping capacity to 750,000 barrels per day. Um, that was an 180,000 barrel increase from what was listed on the original. Um, on the original permit uh, in February of last year, that increase was approved despite the lack of an impact, environmental impact statement. And so uh, here 2021, currently the Army Corps of Engineers is working to gather information to issue that EIS. Uh, there are some talks that they are utilizing some information from 2016. Um, I don't know if that's completely true or not. Uh, let's hope that's not. But this EIS will determine whether the Army Corps will uh, reissue a permit for the line to continue to cross uh, the Missouri River uh, 500 feet from my, my homeland. Uh, the same permit was revoked last year, but the, the, the pipeline was still allowed uh, to continue to operate with that increased capacity. So a request to extend that existing schedule for the EIS is what's happening currently. Uh, the Army Corps has agreed to extend that 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 timeline until September 2022. So they're gathering all the information to complete the EIS. Um, if this EIS is performed correctly, there will be no realistic way for this pipeline to cross our ancestral lands and the only clean water source for my people and millions downstream. Uh, one more thing I'd like to know is that earlier this year, hundreds, uh, hundreds of indigenous leaders, including myself and my organization, advocates, environmental groups, and influencers called on the Biden administration to stand with Sandy Rock and shut down the illegal operation of the Dakota Access Pipeline. This request has not been met. Um, and we know the integrity of the pipeline is, is in question. We don't know if it's leaking or not. And so we will continue to work to spread the awareness. Uh, We ask all of you who are are viewing this to stand with us and call on the Biden Biden administration to shut down Dakota Access Pipeline um, and so that we can protect our water and so that my my people may live. Palami Aye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And now we are going to hopefully, uh, I am sort of reintroducing, but um, now we're, we're very, very fortunate to be able to speak with uh, this economist, author, and activist, Director of Honor the Earth, Winona LaDuc. Winona, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Can you fill us in on what's going on there at level three, uh, line three? Um. Yeah, Enridge is building the largest tar sands pipeline in the world and the last tar sands pipeline in the world. And they pretty much run over our state. About 900 people have been arrested. I spent 
three days in jail myself. The, um, they've burned the rivers uh, with frack outs. They've um, gotten water withdrawals for the tune of 5 billion gallons of water, single largest allocation of water in the history of the state of Minnesota for 150 bucks. And um, they're rolling ahead. They've militarized it heavily. And you know, this in this model that's underway in Minnesota, um, Enbridge, a Canadian multinational, is uh, financing the police up north after the Standing Rock experiment and uh, $38 million instead. Enbridge is paying for the police. And so now you have a situation where the police of Minnesota are now working for the Canadian multinational. And so you could be the water protector that is on the river looking at a frack out. But if you get out of the river, you're going to get arrested, not the corporation. So basically what we have is kind of late staged fossil fuel addiction. That's what I would call it. Pretty much the end of the party. And, um, you know, here you are. And, I, and we're all sitting here wondering why the, the climate president um, just approved and is just sitting there watching um, the single largest tar sands pipeline move ahead. And we've appealed to the Biden administration. We've appealed, you know, just to be clear, like people in Minnesota don't support this pipeline. 68,000 people testified against it and 4,000 people testified for it. The tribes and countless citizen groups have been litigating this for seven years. For seven years, we've been trying to stop this and it was a bad idea seven years ago and it's certainly a worse idea now. Um, and we've um, you know, tried it every turn and the Biden administration seems to pretty much just want to rubber stamp it like the Trump administration. I mean, there's no federal environmental impact statement on this project. This is the equivalent of 50 new coal fire power plants crossing, as you said, 200 rivers. A fifth of the world's water is up here. Violations of our human rights, uh, 900 arrests so far. And, you know, just a huge civil crisis in Minnesota, all for Canadian multinational. And so I'm wondering why Gina McCarthy doesn't want to check on the water. They're about to blow through the line from the Red River Basin to the Superior Basin. And I'm wondering why the Army Corps of Engineers thinks it's okay to put in this pipeline and steal 5 billion gallons of water from the North. We're asking for them to require an EIS. And I know they built the line. I've, I've got the body burden of it to prove. <laughs> I didn't get shot with rubber bullets, but you know, um, it's pretty traumatic looking at what's going on here in Northern Minnesota. And the question I kind of have to the Biden administration, simply put, is, you know, if you look at this company, it should be three strikes or out. I mean, aside from the two largest oil spills in the history of the United States being Enbridge spills, and aside from the fact that, um, you know, Enbridge financed the Dakota Access Pipeline, 28% of it was Enbridge's money after we defeated them on the Sandpiper. And, um, you know, what, what happens with this Canadian multinational gets asked a question. Yeah. Um, when the federal courts ordered Enbridge and, um, you know, Dakota Access to close down, what did they say to the federal courts? Not going to do it. Right? And then um, in Michigan, where you have a 60-year-old pipeline that Enbridge has under the Straits of Mackinac, those, uh, the governor of Michigan, Governor Whitmer and the Michigan DNR said the permit was no longer good because it was too unsafe and in the, in the name of the public trust, they would like that line closed down. They removed the easement. They said they revoked the easement and said, you got to close down the line on May 12th. And what did Enbridge say to the state of Michigan about closing down the pipeline? They said, uh, no, you don't have jurisdiction. Or so you got a Canadian multinational that just told the federal court they weren't going to close down a pipeline, just told the governor they weren't going to close down a pipeline. And so we want them to do an EIS before they put oil in the line. There's no federal EIS. They built the line, but they didn't add the 50 new coal fire power plants that so they didn't go. And, and we want a federal EIS. And we want Gina McCarthy and the Army Corps of Engineers, the Biden administration, we want somebody to do something instead of you know, pretending this is OK and, and being politically sacrificed right, right. by the Biden administration. I think we hear you, and so I think we have marching orders for people who care about this. That uh, there's some there's some questions that need to be answered, and these issues have to be faced. Thank you very much, Winona. Thank you for for filling us in on that. 
Alexis, um, can you talk about the work that you're doing with the International Youth Council? Yeah, so the International Indigenous Youth Council started uh, during the Standing Rock uprisings back in 2016. It was led by Two Spirit and Women uh, Youth, um, and they kind of led a lot of what was going on up there at Standing Rock. I believe you were t we were talking about they did the pinwheel uh, aerial thing that you were t did, and um, you know once uh, everyone left Standing Rock. Uh, we started chapters across Turtle Island. So I was asked to start the Los Angeles chapter of the IOYC. And we really wanted to keep that sacred fire that was started up at Standing Rock and move it into our communities and start doing work within our communities that also, you know, raises awareness on indigenous rights and sovereignty um, and also supports the community in more ways than we can try to. Um, but that's kind of how we got started here. And me personally, I did not go to Standing Rock, but I had a lot of family and friends up there. And the brutality that they experienced up there is unimaginable. And I think it's, you know, crazy that the this is still going on. It's going on in so many front lines today across so many different pipelines across the world. And I think that it's important to continue to have these conversations and continue to give, especially indigenous youth, a front seat at the table to speak on these issues. And um, so I'm very thankful to be here today. I have two youth right now that are up uh, supporting line three um, at one of the camps and they gave me a statement to share with you today. So I'm gonna read that now. The abuses of Enbridge are palpable at Red Lake Treaty lands. Here I received a glimpse of an already hurting land. The water here, Red Lake River, has seen massive die-offs of mussels and lower water levels due to Enbridge pumping away water. Each day I stay near the pipeline's construction. I learn more about this company's disregard for all life. The construction workers of this pipeline are in dissonance. On their break time from desecrating native land, they fish in the very same lake they plan to build the pipeline through. And when confronted, they retreat back to work. They have no right to receive gifts from this lake. They have no right to even be on this land. All they bring is violence. There have already been two Enbridge Line 3 pipeline workers that have been arrested in relation to human trafficking. Enbridge and their workers are predators of the land and native people. This isn't the only pipeline. This isn't the only front line of defense. The fight for indigenous sovereignty is everywhere. It is the battle that requires us all and is for the benefit of all. And that was from Yulu, who's 23 years old. Their affiliations are Nahuatl, Tecuscatan, and Lenca. And so for me, my question here to everyone is, when will we listen to the first caretakers of this land? When there's no clean air to breathe anymore? Or there's no more clean water? And we need to start thinking about the future generations that are going to be devastated by all of this madness that we're creating right now. And I always quote my favorite indigenous wellness advocate, his name is Tosh Collins, who said that the health of the people reflects the health of the planet and vice versa. We are sick and the planet is sick. And as the youth council, we say that we are the land defending itself. So what are you going to do to defend yourself? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think on that note, we will say thank you all for being here. Thank you.